Hey, what is up? This is Jake with Exit Trail Cameras. On this week's video version of our podcast, Trail Cam Radio, we have Damien Riffle. Damien was a past guest for Whitetail Cribs, and it's a really good episode. If you haven't checked it out, uh, it's linked below in the description. Be sure to give it a watch. In this episode, we're talking all about the moon and Damien's take. He has a pretty interesting strategy surrounding the moon, and he has found a lot of success, so be sure uh, to check it out. Share your thoughts on the moon in the comments below. If you enjoy the episode, be sure to leave a like button and subscribe. Now let's get into the interview. Lights, camera. Follow the trail. Ready to shoot. If you know where a deer's bedding and you know where he's eating, that deer should be dead. Camera. If you're passive on a deer, what you're doing is you're teaching. I've got 30 bucks in the Michigan record book. Everyone but one has had at least one previous wound on his body. Some had as many as four. <laughs> Trail Cam Radio from the guys at Exodus. All right, so this is uh, this is take two. We were maybe a couple minutes in, forgot to hit the record button, but right now we're sitting with Damien Riffle in his home, underneath his whitetail body of work. Um, if that name sounds familiar, we did a whitetail cribs episode with him. I don't know, maybe three or four months ago or something. Uh, really cool episode, really cool house, really cool stories, and some and some really big deer. But as we were, I shouldn't say we, as Cameron was here um, filming that Whitetail Cribs episode, there were some things that you had mentioned about uh, the moon that yes. kind of piqued our interest. And the moon is one of those topics we've been talking more and more and more about, uh, kind of selfishly, because it's some things that we've been trying to pay attention to, kind of filter through um, the different opinions, the different takes. And uh, so that's what we're here we're here to talk about the moon, what your thoughts are, your strategies. I know you you have some things that um, that I don't want to say rely on, but you you believe in, I guess. Yes, so, very much so. Um, so before I get let's, before I get too far, um, for anyone who doesn't know you, give uh, give a brief introduction because I'm sure there's probably some listeners that didn't catch that White Tail Cribs episode. Um, just Damian Riffle. I live in northeastern Ohio. I hunt kind of east central Ohio a lot, um, and I don't know. I got uh, probably 25 white tails over 140, and uh, probably 85% of them have been killed in the same window of the moon phase in October. So um, I'm not saying I'm an expert on the moon by any means, but um, in 2000, I think it was two is when I killed my first buck and I, I started kind of paying attention to that point and the next year was the same the next year was the same the next year was the same and uh, th it's pretty much paid off if I'm on a target deer that I have been watching all summer and have a good pattern on him or, uh, of any kind when that moon phase comes into play I'm pretty certain to uh, a large percentage that I'm going to eat, either at least see him moving in daylight or kill him in daylight. So when that time comes, you have a deer pattern, um, you have whatever your target buck, does the weather and everything else go out the window for you? And it's, it's, it's moon phase, whether it's the weather's good or not. So yes and no. So I'll give you a, for <laughs> instance, uh, where I kind of shot myself in the foot. Um, in 2018, I shot my, my biggest buck to date, which is, just shy of 180 inches and the the new moon phase was coming in and I think it was the second so my window that I believe in is I take the new moon I go three days prior and three days after and in that moon in that window I I will not miss an evening hunt I don't hunt in October I don't hunt mornings um, I believe it, it's too risky to go in and bump them off their natural feeding patterns. Um, so I rely strictly on evenings. And when I come out of the woods, I don't let them see me leave the woods. I, I have a, uh, it's, it's an alpha dog, Primo's alpha dog. And I set off a coyote call. As I'm walking to the stand, I hang it in a tree 100, 200 feet from my stand. And if there's deer anywhere around or I feel there might be deer around, I set that thing off and, and clear any deer close to me 
And, uh, and then as I'm easing out, I got to walk right by it and I pick it up. And as I'm walking to my truck, if I have a long walk to the truck, I'll continue to set it off as I'm walking because that keeps bumping the deer further away from you and not seeing a human. They think it's a coyote coming. Um, and I've had great success with that early season and late season. When the snow's on, you're hunting food sources, same exact thing. Same exact thing. Um, so that being said, um, that buck on the, to jump back on that, on the weather, um, I, th I believe it was the second or third day of the new moon phase that I watched for. It was 92 degrees. If you remember in 2018, we got a, like a 90 degree snap right in the middle of the month. And I'm like, I know it's the moon phase. It's 92 degrees. What are the odds? And sure as enough, that evening with a cell cam, my phone goes off, and he's standing at a feeder, of all things, in broad daylight. Well, it was last light. It was the last five minutes of shooting light. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. You know, you know, it was the moon phase. I talked myself out of not hunting because of the heat, and there he was. And I'm kind of down on myself, and I'm like, oh, well, I screwed that up, you know. So the next night, it was 95 degrees. <laughs> And I was like, there's no way he's going to do that two days in a row. And that night, a cell cam went off, and I had him on an oak flat moving in broad daylight. So weather, I don't think, has a whole lot to do with it. That moon phase um, is a, is, is a go-to for me. Now, I do think if you add to that noon, new moon phase a cold front, um, it exponentially increases your odds. Uh, the day I ended up killing him was the fifth day of that new new moon phase, and the cold front came through. It rained all day, and uh, it was supposed to stop at 4. Well, I couldn't get in there before uh, 4, so I went in right at 4, and it quit as I pulled in the farm, which I said that on the Whitetail Cribs episode uh, talking about him. And... Deer instantly started moving, and I'm, you know, bumping a couple does, walking to my stand, and uh, I get up in my stand. I wasn't in my stand an hour, and lo and behold, he comes walking out, you know, in a, in a field checking a scrape line at 5 o'clock in the evening, and I ended up shooting him at 5.30 in the evening right at, in that moon phase with a cold front right after the rain. Um, I And the cold front and the rain – is is a go-to for me i'll sit in the rain any chance i get because that moment that rain stops the, the deer are on their feet right. they get up they shake off and they just start browsing around and if you know where he's at and you can get somewhere close to where you feel he is there's a good chance you'll kill him my 165 i shot same exact scenario I shot him september 30th in the new moon um it was the first day of the october new moon phase it but it fell in september uh that year and uh I shot him at seven o'clock. It poured down rain. I mean, the torrential downpour, and it stopped. And less than five minutes later, he stepped out onto the field, and I, I shot him. So, right. well, there's like there's a couple things I, I want to circle back to. One, um, for anyone who's unfamiliar with the lunar phases or lunar cycle, a new moon is, I guess, considered what I call it a dark moon. Correct. So it's non, it's not illuminated. Like a full moon is typically Correct. illuminated as long as there's no cloud cover. The new moon is the exact opposite. Correct. The opposite of that. So if anybody's wondering if, you know, that's essentially what it is, and, and if you wanted a visual, you could Google that It's called the new quick. moon because it's the new – It the, the From new that moon starts the new lunar cycle. Correct. It starts waning – or, I'm sorry, waxing, waxing. getting yep. bigger at that point, and then once the full moon hits, then it's waning, getting smaller. Right. So – yeah, it's it's the new. It's called new because it's the dark moon starting of the new lunar cycle. Right, right. So, <clears throat> when those when you when you're on a target deer and you know that phase is coming up, um, like I think the October new moon is the 16th or 17th, 16th, 18th, something this year. something yep. like that. Um, are you hunting food sources in those evening sits, or are you like it, d describe that that tactic there? Because it sounds like you're on. Field edges, food sources. Yes and no. So the, a lot of the property that I, I hunt is uh, reclaimed strip mine. So you have a lot of field edge. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, the, the farms that I hunt uh, don't have a lot of cover. So I try not to get into the cover because you start going into the cover, you're going to start bumping deer. They don't have a lot of options of bed. You start bumping them, they're not going to be bedding there, that sort of thing. So October, I rely on 
uh, food sources, uh, depending on if it's a food plot, acorns, apple trees, whatever the case may be. I do run feeders. Um, I don't hunt directly over feeders very often because I just think it's very low percentage on killing big mature deer. Um, yeah, you agreed. know, in Ohio, everybody and their brother feeds and any mature deer realizes a big pile of corn is not natural. Um, but occasionally one will be dumb and, and come in and I, I'm not going to pass up the opportunity if I feel like I, I can outsmart him. Um, but, uh, what was the question? <laughs> well, it was just the, the uh, uh, whether or not you're hunting on food sources, so like a stand location. It's it's transition from where I feel they're bedding to food source, all the way to the food source. Okay. If if I got photos of him coming into a food source and he feels comfortable coming into that food source, uh, food plot, whatever it may be, in daylight, I will hunt the food source. Right. But I will try to get as close to his bedding that I wherever I feel he's bedding and, yeah. and try to catch him coming and, and using trail cameras to figure out his you right. know travel routes by that yeah 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 100 percent um one of the things like we've and again we've been talking to a ton of different people on the moon and what their thoughts are and every the the thing for me is where I get hung up is everyone has like their own yeah, strategy 100 like, percent you know, Justin Hollinsworth, a guy uh, just just south of here. It's weird that you, his is almost the opposite of his his belief is almost the opposite of what yours is. So he's hunting. I think it's plus or minus three days after a full moon. Mm -hmm. So you're at the new moon. He's at the full moon. He's uh, I think four days before and four days after. So there's whatever. But he's he's ignoring the day before the full moon and a day after the full moon. So sure. there's three days there. It's, you know, no go for him. Um, so as we start to talk to all these people, there's there's transit times, overhead underfoot stuff. Sure. There's cloud cover. There's uh, moon phase. My An interesting thing that I'm, I'm, I, I'm guess, is going through my mind wondering if any of this other stuff around the moon lines up with the new moon. So – have you ever paid attention to the transit times yes, over head under foot stuff? So and actually, I printed those out so I can talk to a little more in yeah, depth on them. Yeah, yeah. And and so if anybody's interested in going to the moon, looking in the moon phase, uh, the Farmer's Almanac website is by far the best that I've found because you can you can go in there. They have the moon calendar, and if you scroll down to the bottom of the moon calendar, you can pick your dates for whatever moon you want or whatever month. And then you scroll down to the bottom of the page, and they have rising and setting times for the moon. Mm -hmm. And that's all the information you need. And they also have when it's overhead. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, um, this year, uh, the 16th is the new moon. It's rising at uh, 7, 11 a.m., setting at 7, 04 p.m. Overhead. Straight overhead at 1 o'clock. Yeah. Not ideal for hunting. Right. Um, if you can get that moon and find out where it's overhead or underfoot in that moon phase. I, yeah, you, I do agree with that. Um, if it's if you're hunting and it's already and it's overhead and it's past um, straight overhead, m more towards the setting side, it's not ideal. Um, if so, and typically with the new moon, it's rising in the morning, setting in the evening. So you really want to pay attention to when it's underfoot. So if um, I kind of draw out a, a, a clock or look at a clock, it's just easier for me to draw it out and, and uh, look at things. So on the 16th, it's rising at uh, 7 a.m., setting at 7 p.m. So you, you're right in that range right here. So, you, you know, you're, you're straight overhead is 1 o'clock, so you're underfoot is, um, you know, tra the exact opposite of that, you know. So... The way I always do that, I take, and I don't use the Farmer's Almanac, but I use Weather Underground. Mm -hmm. does a similar thing, gives you the rise and set. You take that time, um, and I just basically divide, find the half. And that's and it's not exact, but it gives you a rough idea. It gives idea. you a real close. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, but, yeah, I, I and, and if you can, again, back to the weather, if you can add up uh, the moon, the new moon overhead or rising um, with a cold front, it's – you know, I go in the woods those days, and I I feel like I'm going to be dragging something out of the woods that evening. Yeah, um, it, it, you're pretty confident. The year I killed my big one, the the day that happened, I think it was the the first uh, 
it was right before the heat wave hit that year. Um, I think it was the first day. It had rained part of the day. The moon, the new mo or the moon was going to be underfoot the last hour of daylight, and uh, it was just like perfect. The w it everything. was cool, yeah. everything. And I walked in there, and that and that buck was bedding on the neighboring farm. And as I drive up the lane, I look over, and I can see <laughs> he had brush hogged that field. He was walking across every evening to come <laughs> over to my property <laughs> that day. And I, <laughs> I almost just went went home. Yeah. I was like, "You got to be kidding me!" Because you knew he blew right. him out of there, you know, brush hogging. But it, uh, it, it, yeah. <laughs> but it worked out in the long run. So. Well, I think with the with the overhead and underfoot stuff, um, it, that's something that I've really tried to pay more attention to because I, I've, I've seen deer move at specific times that may be correlated. I mean, some of the stuff's in November, so mm -hmm. that, you know, you know, deer under feet, anyways. But. It seems like a lot of guys that are killing deer with purpose are talking about the overhead underfoot times lining up within, you know, two hours, let's yeah. say, of dawn and dusk, yep. uh, you know, shooting light. And essentially just giving you that movement five, ten, maybe 15 minutes before, mm -hmm. you know, closing time per se. But um, what do you think, you know, with the new moon um, in those three days ahead, three days, three days after, what is it that you've that you feel is getting deer on their feet? Is it the low light of, I, of the night? Or? I do feel it's the low light of the night. Um, and I, I think that – and I, and I agree with uh, the other gentleman you were saying about the full moon, mm -hmm. except the full moon, you have an abundance of light. Mm -hmm. So I feel I, – so I think it probably relates to the, the full moon and the full new moon cycle – you know, because they're both full. So I'm sure they 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 um, correlate with each other. However, with the new moon, I think that window is bigger because it is darker at night. And, um, th again, it's just my opinion, and I feel like you have more opportunities in that time, especially if you get the moon overhead or underfoot in those last couple hours of daylight. Um they get up early. They know it's going to get dark, and it's d more difficult for them to see. And uh, they they seem to move better, you know. Whereas with the full moon, they have enough. I mean, if you and I can walk around easily at night, you know, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's yeah, like broad daylight to them. So, have you? Uh, the other, I guess, question there would from me or from from us or the, what's going through my mind is: Have you have you ever paid attention to? the cloud cover regardless of the moon phase and how much light is actually available at night because that's something that's it's been brought up more than once by more than one person mostly related around the full moon and the illumination of the full moon right a lot of guys talk about the full moon and deer being super super well i guess when it's it's a bright moon we'll call it a bright moon a sure. bright full moon that uh deer are more social at night they're back to bed early before daybreak and then sure. there's good midday movement because they've you know they've been bedded down for three four five hours mm -hmm. they're getting up no one around um and then there's been guys that say that cloud cover dictates really is what dictates that movement because the illumination so if even if you do have a full moon it's uh you know it's crappy weather or whatever ton of cloud cover it's still a dark night they're not seeing that same type of midday movement the next day i've followed with the new moon, I'll pay attention to cloud cover. With the new moon, obviously, it doesn't it right. does, that doesn't exist um, because it's dark regardless. And but for the new or when you have your your full moon, I I do agree with that. That if it's you know crappy weather and it's overcast all night or raining all night or whatever the case may be, that you're going to get nor more n normal movement patterns the following day. Mm -hmm. Whereas if it's bright all night, yeah, they they could be back to bed you know, before the sun even comes up, typically, right. you know, right. so. Okay. So, I guess we're like, uh, I don't know, 15, 60 minutes in, talking about all these different theories, I guess. Um, so, I, we're familiar with your, your body of work, and I guess the uh, solidification or validation behind what you're talking about in, in that body of work. So, give us just a rundown of... How many deer you've killed in that in this new moon 
what phase or time frame. So what are we looking at here? Uh, 4, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, So I can see 13 heads right here. And the first one's 157. He was October 13th, new moon. Uh, next one is 146. He was October 12th, new moon. 165, September 30th, new moon. 170, October 19th, new moon. Uh, 165, October 15th, new moon. Uh, the next one, it was 140. He was uh, October 23rd, new moon. Next one, he was, uh, that's a, a November kill. The next one there is October 30th, new moon. That one is my wife's on the end. Um, October, the, the uh, highest one up there, he was uh, October 26th, the new moon. And then my 180 was October 19th. And the last one up top, he was in November. Those are, those are all the ones just right here. And all of them were killed in October in the new moon phase. So there are very few of them. I've, I've only killed, uh, I think, three bucks in my life in November. Mm -hmm. Three good ones. I mean, obviously, when you're younger and you're not shooting mature deer, uh, those were November. But um, once <coughs> I got into shooting mature deer and, and, and targeting specific bucks, almost every single one of them is, has been um, in uh, October. The year before I shot my 180, um, he broke off his entire right beam right when I felt like I was going to get an opportunity to kill him. And uh, I jumped to um, the third largest buck on the farm because I put my wife on the second largest buck on the farm and she killed him. So um, when I did that, obviously – that are through my whole moon cycle phase <laughs> because I was targeting him. And then I, right in that window when I thought it was going to happen, he broke off and I had to jump. So I ended up shooting that buck in November. Um, and uh, So two questions here. Um, when the moon, when these, when the new moon, the first new moon of the hunting season comes in, are you, are you doing anything prior to that? Or are you specifically waiting for the new, like you already have your target deer, you have a, your hit list built, you're watching these deer over the summer. Are you doing anything between the opener and that first new moon? Yeah, I, I'm still hunting. Okay. Um, I'm not going to not hunt because you never know. Um, there's deer killed every day that aren't in that moon phase. So um, I, I do go very low impact, I'm huge on that. If the, the moment you let a deer know that, there's people after him or, or seeing deer people all of a sudden in the woods and they're not used to it, um, that they're onto it and their, their patterns will change mm -hmm. and, and, uh, the jig is up. So that is one thing like the, that I do believe, and, you know, people say, you know, stay out of areas, don't check your trail cameras. I think there, there is a benefit in a regularity of checking trail cameras that are easily accessible on field edge and uh, letting them kind of get used to some sort of human scent mm -hmm. on on a regular basis. Whereas, you know, I if they come out on that field edge and, you know, every other day or, you know, th there's one farm I would go in, my one main lease, I would go in every day at noon before cell cameras and check all of my cameras on, the, on field edges that are simple to get to. And I, some of those nights I would go back in and hunt and those deer would not even – phase them they would walk right across my my trail i would walk in there with work boots on and they would they would get used to that and right. they, they you know um i i do believe that they will adjust to some human scent if if it's a regularity you know they, yeah. they're going to come across yep it. yeah i agree with that 100 percent. i i don't think um uh, that idea or concept i don't think is that foreign some people are like oh my god you can't do it right but i think the important thing like you said is the consistency of how you do that maybe it's a time of day maybe it's sure maybe it's you, you're riding a bicycle maybe you're riding a four-wheeler maybe you're riding a, you, maybe you're driving your truck or what however you do it if you do it the same way over and over and over and over where it's not a threat then i think that you're right i think you do get used to that yep um give us an example of some of those impact sits that you're talking about you know from the opener to that first 
new moon before you start to get aggressive? Um, a lot of those, um, I'm big on, um, if I'm, my, my main lease that I had, it sold, unfortunately. Um, I, I planted a lot of cover crop to gain access to my stands or blinds or whatever I would be hunting. I would plant um, a lot of sorghum, um, corn. I do, so w when I planted the corn for it, t um, if you plant small amounts of corn, the, the deprivation from coons and, and deer, they tear it down and it serves you no purpose. So a lot of that times I planted corn because it's relatively cheap to, to plant and easy to plant is I would plant it really late into the summer and throw the nitrogen to it like there's no get out and it would never come to, to ear. It mm -hmm. wouldn't have enough time to ear, but it would still grow tall. And then you wouldn't have coons tearing it down, deer tearing it down, and you'd have that cover later in the year. Um, I would also, um, the one elevated blind that I put in my, the big f field, it was five acres. Um, I enclosed the entire bottom of it. It was 10 feet off the ground. I covered the entire bottom of it. And then I, when I planted uh, my corn, I would go in with uh, um, 2 4 D and spray a trail the entire length of the field and um, to the blind. So, and I many times I have taken people in and you would climb up in the box blind and there'd be deer in the field. Or you would get down last light, slip out, and the deer would never know you were there, you know. Um, so, that is the type of low impact that I, I do. Uh, my buddy, one evening, it's kind of a funny story. I took him in um, the year I shot uh, Haas up top, um, a buck that I was very familiar with. As a five-year-old, he lived on the farm every, every day up until he turned five. And five, he was gone. I don't know where he went. Um, after figuring things out, and I, I had a five-acre field of soybeans planted in that blind and then corn on the back side of it. And the day, I think it was third day of season, I went in at noon, checked my cameras, and the four-year-old that was kind of ruling a roost all summer, I had him on camera. I had eight cameras on the edge of that field on the outskirts of it, and he was on every single one of them, and he would be feeding. The next photo, he'd be looking over his shoulder, and the next photo, that five-year-old would be walking into frame with his ears back. Every single camera, I had him on that. And uh, I told my buddy, I, I called him up, I was like, you got to get out of work. I said, the kicker eight just showed back up, and he's asserting his dominance. We got a cold front coming in this evening. This buck will be here tonight on this field. And uh, so we went in that evening and uh, got up in the stand, and the deer started coming out. And uh, I had eaten something that uh, didn't really agree with me that <laughs> night. And, <laughs> and I told him, it's getting to prime time, right? Yeah. I'm like, I'm not going to be able to make this sit. Like, I got... I got a problem going on, and there's there's 14 deer out in this field, and I get down out of that blind, and I take my trail, and I go all the way to the far end of the field, which was 220 yards, handle my business, and come back and get up in the blind, and all them deer are still out in the field. Didn't bump a single one of them. Five minutes later, that buck comes out in the field, and he shoots him. That's crazy. So that that's the type of, of low impact that you can do if you put the work in to to make it happen, you know. Right. So I, that's a that's a little bit bit of a different perspective because I think most people talk about low impact sits. They're sitting way back, kind of maybe out of the action, maybe doing observation sure. sits where you're really putting a lot of work and planning and preparation into access ingress um, egress. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly. that's that's the uh, you can do you can be in the heat of things if you have you know that the uh, the access to get in and out without you know, bumping deer and letting them know. How particular are you uh, with the wind? Very, extremely. Both for scent control or just to, to hunt to hunt your deer. Like, are you are you hunting deer based on the wind, or are you monitoring the wind based on, um, or both? Both. Yeah. So and and you know it, where I'm at in the hill country of of o eastern c central eastern Ohio. You know, you got to th throw in the, the thermal aspect of it as well down there. And, you know, a lot of my hunting 
and and plantings I do up high, which I feel is not the the best because typically deer want to be down low after dark, in my opinion, because all those cold thermals, the cold air sucks down and they can lay down in a meadow in the bottom and all everything around them is getting pulled down to them and and they feel safer. However, y it's hard to hunt them there. So you got to hunt them where you can kill them. So I plant and try to bring them up high. And what I've found by doing that is even though I have, um, let's call them destination size food plots, um, they use them as transition, which works out into my benefit because they will come in early season, browse around for five, 10 minutes, then head down low to the low fields towards dark. Helps me in two ways. A, they don't annihilate my food plot before late season when I really want to draw in on them. And two, those deer come in and move off before I want to get out of stand. Yep. So when late season comes, my now transition kill plots or whatever you want to call them um, become destination because the, the food sources are limited. So now it pulls them in and, um, you know, it, so it, it kind of flips roles l in late season. That's a really good uh, perspective. I don't think I've ever heard that, but that makes it – ton of sense and in hill country typically like this is what we see usually those you know the does are usually bedded on up on those very tops and those bucks are down on the leeward side of, of, the, of, of those ridges it probably gets that bedding structure uh tighter or a little bit closer to food where that movement happens maybe a little bit earlier in the, yes. in the evening yep yeah so yeah there's a lot of times that you'll you know you're only on stand a few minutes and y you know you think you're plenty early and next thing you know you got does popping out and right. they'll, they'll just feed around. And it's always fun to w sit there and watch deer for hours, but it's nerve wracking because yeah. you get complacent and then you scratch your nose and you got a big yeah, old yeah. nanny <laughs> standing there staring at you, you know, or something stupid. Uh, so I, l I like that aspect that, you know, they'd come in, they'd feed around, they give you that opportunity to keep you engaged, keep you on your toes, and then they feed off. Yeah. You know, I, I really, that, that wor has worked really well for me. Um, I want to circle back a little bit back to the back to trail cameras and back to back to the new moon um i mean obviously you've been paying attention to this stuff for the last 18 years i guess 17 hunting seasons 18 years whatever whatever that's been almost 20 years how much how much data have you have you collected or gotten um through running a lot of cameras to kind of back that new moon daylight theory theory up i mean i'm, I'm i imagine there's a there's a ton there but i'm just curious yeah um how to p quantify that I, I don't really know how to say but over the years you know even you know there there's there are several different deer you know that you are are mature that you're watching and i might specifically be after one and not really paying a whole lot of attention to the the other ones right um but when i go and check check cameras and the the information the cameras are telling me that those other mature deer would have given me the opportunity in that same time frame mm -hmm. and you know usually it, it all of them in that window sometime it, i'm you know i, I don't want to guarantee you but if you're if you have a mature deer and you know where he's feeding and you know where he's bedding and you hunt evenings and you don't screw it up early season by bumping him out, out of his pattern or whatever, um, I, I'm extremely confident going in the woods that I'm probably going to kill him in that in that time frame. So what's um, – you've said this a couple of times, but why, why not hunt the mornings? Like what's your – You know, your so deer are – when you're – there's a difference between deer hunting – and hunting a specific one deer. You don't know what's going on when you pull in that farm. Those deer have been doing the same thing for the last three months every morning for the most part and have no intrusion, have no reason to change that. So you decide you're going to hunt open in morning, say, and you drive in your farm. All of a sudden there's headlights going in the farm and the deer see those headlights, 
might not spook them. Um, then all of a sudden you're walking to your stand and you blow out does and they're running and snorting or whatever, you know, just being deer. And that buck is 100 yards away. All of a sudden these deer are running and they're pushing him and bumping him. Or worst case scenario is you bump him and he physically sees you or smells you and he runs to the neighboring farm. He is no longer on that same pattern he's been on for the last three months. Then you go in that evening and be like, oh, he's been here every evening, you know, all summer long. Well, you bumped him that morning. He's no longer on that pattern, so he's not going to be there. And if he comes in, it's going to be the next day or, you know, he maybe if he's one of the really finicky ones, he changes his pattern altogether, right. you know. So I feel I will not hunt a, a morning until about October, or I'm sorry, October, um, Halloween. Waiting, waiting for the rut. Yeah, once they start getting into that cruising phase where they're just kind of out seeking and, and scent checking and, you know, nudging does around a little bit, um, then it's not as um, dangerous, say, <laughs> to uh, to go in, in my opinion. Uh, you know, I know guys that hunt mornings all and have no problems with it, and but it, it's not worth it to me the way I hunt deer to go in and and risk that i don't need to i've i've never i've never had to hunt mornings to kill the deer that i wanted i hate getting up early too so that could have some a little and maybe that talks yeah, me into yeah. it um it uh i if it comes to a point where i have to get in there and i'm not saying if you got a deer that's coming in on a food plot that, you know crazy early and you have the that the ingress that some of my food plots had that I wouldn't attempt it, you know, I'm, I'm but on a day to day, I'm going to say no. Right. Well, I, th I think so much deer hunting, regardless of what your strategy or tactic is, so much of it is confidence in what you're doing, confidence in your set and thinking things kind of into fruition per se. Right. Um, because once you start the self doubt game and, you know, thinking, oh, what if I did this? And you think about all the what ifs, all the di different circumstances. Like it, it just turns into a shit show. It just, it just does. Totally. Um, so I understand, um, you know, the confidence thing of, you know, what ifs in the morning? Am I bumping a deer? Did he smell me? Did he see me? And um, I think a lot of it too has to do with the size property, how much room you have to sure. really roam um, on whether or not you hunt mornings. I mean, if there's a guy hunting, a specific deer on a piece of public that's you know twenty thousand acres. Mm -hmm. You just go find you bump them. You just go find them again. Right. Like it, it might be a little more work, but sure. if you think you can kill them that morning, go for it. You know? Yep. Um, whereas if you're in a on a smaller piece, like if you bump that deer and goes to the neighbors, that right. might be the last time and you bump that deer. And you got to take into account what your neighbors are doing too. Well, that's Cause it. If your neighbors are hunting mornings and that buck's betting on your neighbor, yeah, he's going to screw it up yeah, for you. Exactly. You know, if you're hunting a twenty acre tract and all four, three or four of your neighbors are all going in and hunting mo first morning, you know, they're going to mess it up for you because there's a very low percentage that that buck is hanging out on your property and betting on your property. The one thing, like, when guys start talking about hunting mornings, um, it's, it tends to be a lot of moon guys. Like, the overhead underfoot stuff mm -hmm. starts to come into play. Like, if it's a, I know guys that if it's a crap moon phase or uh, transit times, like, they won't hunt at all. But then when the moon is doing a certain thing, then they're gonna, they'll are gonna they go and hunt, hunt a bedding area in the mornings waiting for that deer to come back maybe, I don't know, five minutes late or right. or whatnot. I know the DeQuistos are, are uh, really big believers in that. Um, do you got, any, you got anything, Cameron? I, I knew you would. What the – yeah. Mm -hmm. I yeah okay
the full moon around the end of the month? It's the hunter's moon. Yeah. Well, really? hunter's moon is the October moon, which that goes back to, you know, pre-electricity is when farmers and ranchers or whatever you want to call them would harvest their meat for the winter and prep it and salt it and everything to so that's why it got the, the hunter's moon. Keep rolling. We're good. All right, we're going to pick this up at, uh, we'll call it 3930. Give me about 20 seconds. <coughs> okay. So as we were going through this discussion, I knew uh, I knew Cameron would have some questions, so um, he jotted a couple things down. Damien, what um, have you ever put any thought into the timing of the new moon? And you know, if that new moon is later in October, um, when it kind of lines up with that pre-rut or maybe rut type movement, do you see any effects? Yes, I I do. Um, the you always I like it when it runs into that later part because you are getting that. Their their testosterone levels are starting to peak. They're starting to get that that anticipation of the rut coming in. You might have a couple does popped early, and uh, really set things off. But it, the later in the month that you can get in that new moon to fall, or I mean, you have no call on it. But when it does happen later in the month, um, it does the the movement seems to be really good, especially pre rut. You know, it'll it'll look like your your rut's going to be in crazy intense because you're seeing all this activity and then november hits and it, it almost drives uh, dries up you know and it it's i think it it has to do with that new moon falling in that pre-rut it really just peaks the, the the daylight movement you know going into to the actual rutting cycle so it's safer to say the later in the month that that new moon phase hits the better that daylight movement yeah i would say a, a perfect storm if I could ask for it every year, it would be a new moon with a cold front <laughs> and some rain <laughs> and the new moon being on like the 26th. <laughs> that would be like the, the perfect year. Well, so here's a question that I actually do not know. Um, and maybe you do, maybe you don't. Maybe Cameron might have to Google this. But what, so the lunar phase, what dictates, like how does that move or progress through the month? Like every year, so this this October we have a new moon the 16th or 17th I think 16th. we talked about. Yep. So next year it'll be how many days off of that? Um, so it's it's pretty much if you wanted to figure it out, uh, it's it's like every two weeks you go from new moon to to full moon, and then so you got I think it I, I want to say it's like a 17 day cycle. Don't quote me on that, but okay. that for whatever reason. So every year it's going to adjust a little bit you mm -hmm. know just like you know hunting season opening day is the first saturday of the month well it could be on the the 30th the 29th the right. you know so it it'll adjust I, I believe what was it last year i want to say it was like the 19th last year and then it's the 16th this year um so the, what is that three days difference yeah. and then the previous year i want to say it was on the 14th or in that ballpark maybe it's the 12th on in 2018 so um you know it, it adjusts just a couple days you know from year to year mm -hmm. okay what about um the other the other question cameron had was is there ever a new moon phase that you won't hunt and you maybe kind of touched on that a little bit um earlier, but no uh, up until 2018 i was you know 90 degree heat and i was like nope i'm gonna sit this one out okay. they ain't they're not gonna move in this and they he proved me wrong so um after that um it doesn't matter if it's 100 degrees i'll still so how many times how many times have you hunted i mean it, i already know the answer to this but i want to ask it anyways because there's probably people wondering it how many in the past 18 years i mean you've killed 13 bucks on new moon phases but how many times have you sat in a new moon phase and like been completely stunked skunked um those the on those three or four or five six evening sets I don't think ever. Yeah, I can. I mean, there's there's times like leading up to shooting my my, my biggest. I saw him three days in a row, 
in uh, broad daylight, mm-hmm. and then you know sometimes they follow the script. the The day before, so th- the story with that one, um, we had the heat wave, and then the next day the temp dropped, and I went in and hunted him, and he came out um, in the neighboring field behind me, and I could see I couldn't see the field directly. I could just see little through the treetops. I can see little pieces of it. And I p- was glassing those little pieces, and it was, I want to say it was like an hour and a half before daylight or dark. I looked out there, and in one of those little holes where I could see through, he was standing in it. And it was way before dark, you know. And I'm like, man, it, there he is. And then he walked over, and he checked a scrape, and he came back out into the, that field, and he started cutting across it. And when he got, the last I saw him, he was probably... 120 yards behind me going through and he was heading kind of downwind of me so he was betting on the neighbors there was a big saddle and then I the all the acorns that year were on me and there's a ton of them um, were on me and then I also ran a feeder up on the ridge and he would come across that feed through the the uh, acorns and then go up and sometime in the night he would hit that feeder typically as well Um, And he was kind of circling hard on that west wind, heading downwind of me. And uh, I do run ozone, and I had the ozone out. And so at that point, I'm like, I'm just, I lost sight of him behind the trees, but he was feeding that direction. And uh, I'm like, okay, so he's heading downwind, horrible situation. So I'm like, the more you move around, I believe... With, with proper scent control, ozone helps, but I don't think it's a, a catch-all, cure-all. Um, but the more you move around, you're pushing scent molecules out of, out of your clothing. So at that point, I just sat down, breathed through my nose, because they can smell your breath, and s- figured if he comes through here, by the time he gets to me, it's t- he'll be, a- had passed down through my downwind. So... I sat there till dark and 15 minutes after and uh, he never showed up. I hit the coyote call. I eased out that evening. I kept the coyote call running uh, as I walked out to my truck. And uh, then the next evening I went in and I have another stand about 50 yards from that stand that's right on the property line that I can see that entire field. And I thought, well, if he comes across that field and does the same thing, because it was the exact same wind conditions, um, that I would see what he was doing exactly, and hopefully he would come right across and walk right up the lane that I thought he walked through the night before, cross over the property line, I could shoot him at 22 yards. So I look, and it was early again, probably an hour before daylight, or dark, I keep saying daylight, and I look across the reclaim, and he steps out into an oil well opening. And he's kind of nudging a couple does around. And he, he's, I feel like he knows I'm there because he's just staring. <laughs> like it, he would just nudge them does around, and then he would stop and just stare in my direction. And he's 300 yards away, you know. Yeah. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. So he uh, – and then he started f- staring up at the field he was in the night before. And then he went up the saddle, went into that field, walked straight across that field, hit the same scrape he did the night before. And I was like, oh, man, this is going to happen, you know. As soon as he left that scrape, I knew I was screwed because the night before he cut, left that scrape, he cut across the field. And this night he was hugging the tree line. And when they hug that tree line, he walks down and uh, – he, go, he walks the tree line and walks in the woods. And where he walked in the woods, the last time I could see his feet, he was 60 yards and walking right underneath the stand that I hunted the day before. <laughs> and I could have shot him at 10 yards. So I thought. So I'm all down in the dumps thinking, okay, he's past me. He's gone. I, so I sit there and I, I'm looking for 10 minutes and see nothing, hear nothing. So I hang my bow up and uh, I sit back down. And it was probably five minutes later, I hear this, the whole treetop shakes. And there's squirrels. The acorns are crazy. So squirrels running there everywhere. And I just figured as a squirrel, I turn around. He's 12 yards behind me in this thicket rubbing a tree. So I stand up. I grab my bow. And 
I look like I'm doing like 1980s jazzer size up there trying to find a hole to shoot through, but I couldn't find anything. It was like trying to shoot through a straw bale, you know. And uh, I did have one shooting lane going up behind me that I could get a shot at if he went that way. And when he left that tree, he started angling it. He was just going to cut the very corner of it. And I, I would have had a, like a, a four foot wide gap to shoot him. And uh, so I had to lean way out around the tree to get to it first. And I drew back as I seen him coming and it was only 23 yard chip shot. And he steps out in the lane and he's kind of quartering up the hill away from me. And I touch it off and my string I don't e I've never shot with a face mask on in my life and I didn't pull my face mask down and it, the string caught I don't know what it was on my face mask about ripped my head off when I shot <laughs> and I missed him by four feet and he didn't know what happened he just bound over the hill and stood there for a minute and then he walked over the hill and uh, I you know that just is gut-wrenching you know you get your opportunity you feel yeah. you did everything right and you screw it up like that but if something bad's going to happen, it's going to happen on, on a big one. And uh, <laughs> Tell me that. so so I'm all down in the dumps. I, I just get down and leave. It's not even dark yet, and I'm just disgusted with myself. So the next evening, wind was totally wrong. It was straight out of the south. I hunted in the area on the far end of the oaks uh, where, you know, low percentage, but you, it's a weekend, so you want to be in the woods, you know. Didn't see him. Um then th Monday, it was raining all day, supposed to stop at 4, and I got there right at 4. I go in, and uh, I'm in the stand, I don't know, an hour maybe, and I look down in the bottom, and it was 5.05, so yeah, just after over an hour, and uh, I see this big body deer come out of the, the, the uh, bottom, and he starts working up the drainage. And so here, uh, let me backtrack on that. So that day I, t I called my best friend since high school and I told him, I was like, man, I said, I really want to set that, that property line stand because you can see like 70 acres from that stand of reclaim. I'm like, if he moves anywhere, I'll see w what he was. Cause right. he, he disappeared. He wasn't on camera for, for that entire night, any of my cameras anywhere. And uh, so I'm like, but my fear is that he will circle, now that I spooked him there, he's going to circle further downwind of me than, you know, what he was would normally do coming through that saddle. And uh, I said, but if he does that, if he comes out on that far side of the reclaim, I can get down and sprint 80 yards to the other side of the draw to another stand that I have. And, uh, you know, it rained all day. It's going to be wet. You can do it quietly. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, but, I mean, that's, that's pretty risky. But that's exactly how I killed him. So he came out in that bottom, and he started working up that drainage, and he hit a scrape. He worked up a little further, hit a scrape. He's at like 250 yards. And uh, at that point, he stopped, and he started looking up this draw that would put up to the field where I had previous two encounters with him. Or if he continued up that draw, he would come – into that wooded draw, it's like a little point that puts down, and when they hit that, they circle that that hill, and they come up, and it puts them straight downwind to the wind stand I'm sitting in. So when he left that scrape, he committed to coming into that draw, and he's just slow, kind of meandering. He's not in any hurry. He's just slowly going, and I'm like, do I do this? Do I, you know, now I'm second guess myself. Am I really going to get down and sprint to that other stand over there? And I'm like, I got to, because I know where he's going to come out. He's going to come out in between me and that other stand someplace straight downwind. And uh, so I grab my bow, and I start down the ladder sticks, and three rungs from the ground, I can still see down into that bottom. I pull my binos up, and he's just slowly sauntering up that draw, up that drainage, hit the ground, sprint 80 yards over to that white oak, get up in that stand, and I'm sitting there. Heart's pounding, you know, and now I'm like, I, I know he's, th th I, this is going to happen. He's got to come up through here. And uh, I'm sitting there, and I start hearing things, and I'm, I'm sure I'm just making it up. But I'm like, it sounded like deer, like just a step here and there while, you know, how they browse on acorns. And uh, I thought he was, like, right here, you know, 25 yards behind this hickory tree, and he's going to step out any time. <laughs> and for whatever reason, so to give you kind of, <coughs> 
foresight of where I'm sitting. I'm sitting on a lane. It used to be a haul road for the coal. It's about 25 yards wide, and they just reclaimed it. Now it's just a, a CRP grassy mm-hmm. junk, you know. And uh, I'm sitting there, and I'm, I'm focused, like, hawk-eyed on this spot right here. And I just glance down the lane, and he is standing right on the edge, 57 yards, straight downwind, 35 yards downwind of the stand that I was previously sitting at. And he's looking upwind. So he's scent checking that other stand. For all I know, he could have been smelling my equipment in that stand, you know, because he, he stood there long enough that I ranged him, set, shooting a single pin. I, I dialed in my yard for 57 yards. I drew on him as I stood. And I, after missing him, I have never focused that hard on a shot in my life. And when the shot broke, like, it scared me. Like, I was like, oh, God, it went off, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. And he mule kicked and ran 20 yards in just across that lane. As soon as he broke through the, the model floor of rows, he stopped. And as soon as he stopped, I'm like, he's dead. And he just tipped over right there. I heart shot him. Wow. So, um, that that deer that's pretty crazy it was in, intense everything about that deer you know with the history of him and the year before breaking off and you know finding the just the base of of when he shed and um that, that deer being my biggest is just yeah. everything about it is special right. you know yeah. so it uh he, he'll i can't imagine ever beating him you know i might kill bigger but that hunt will probably yeah. still be yeah top of the list that's pretty wild man um you know, some of the stuff, we, we do all these Whitetail Cribs episodes, and, like, Cameron remembers all these stories, but there's a lot of them that, like, we watch them, but you don't, I mean. Right. We do. You're editing. So 50 or 60 of them or whatever a year. It's like, you, you don't really get every single story, like, for what it's what it is or sure. what it's worth, you know what I mean? We kind of look at it on topical level, topical level, but um, that's pretty incredible, like, sitting here hearing that story and, like, seeing the emotion on your face, like. Yeah, I was visually seeing that play out. That's it's that's pretty wild. It's a pretty intense hunt. Yeah, I've I've been fortunate to to hunt to uh, have a couple like that. And, and you know, to, to me, hunting specific deer, like you have such a, a, a intimate relationship with them. And as as many cameras as I run, like you know, I I have tons and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of photos of these deer, and when you shoot them, it, it's bittersweet. Mm-hmm. Like, I love doing it. I love the challenge of going after specific deer. But the moment, like, when I when he fell over dead, like, I walked up to him, and it, it was like, it, it, he just was laying there, and it was just like, I, I actually took a photo of him, like, from, like, 10 yards away of him just laying where he fell. It was, like, right up against the log. And I just sat down on a log and, and looked at him for probably five minutes before I even went up and touched him. Like mm-hmm. it was, it, uh, it, it hits you in the feels, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. And you know that you will never go to your trail cameras and pull another photo of that See deer yep. or open your app on your phone and look at a, a at him standing there. It, um, it's definitely bittersweet, but it's, it's, it's very rewarding at the yeah, same time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, on that note, I think that's a probably a pretty good place to, to wrap this thing up, we've uh, taken about an hour of your time up, and um, we have a couple more stops today. So, is there anything else you wanna you wanna touch on or add? Or I don't think so. I think we're good. You guys are good. Yeah, I think. I mean, I can talk deer hunting all day. But <laughs> 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 you guys got other places to be. Absolutely. Um, so, is there any uh, any place you want to drive our listeners to check you out, follow you on social, or anything um, like that? I got Damien Hunts on Instagram. Okay. Um, I try not to get too many crazy people that I don't know on Facebook, <laughs> um, but I am on Facebook. But uh, if, if you have like a deer photo on your profile or something, there's a chance I'll add you, but yeah. it, don't yeah. add my wife because everyone adds me. And then my wife's like, who's this requested to be my friend? I go, I don't know who that is. <laughs> well, you're friends with them. <laughs> so I know this. I know the same feeling. We have like the, um, the Facebook Instagram split too, where like the Facebook stuff is a little more family. Yeah close close circle and then instagram is like all right whoever but yeah yeah anyways damon we appreciate the time we appreciate the thoughts on the moon i think uh, a lot of people are going to find this pretty damn interesting um hope so and like i'm i'm no expert but why well, I, I think the cool thing is to get all these the different perspectives from all the all these folks on sure. the moon and then you know being mid-september now this episode will probably go live next week it gives people 
enough time to have these thoughts like kind of fresh in their mind and pay attention to see what's going on on their property, especially with sure. cell cameras. I mean, you can be thinking about this stuff right now and then you're running your cell cams and you can see stuff correlate in real time versus, mm -hmm. you know, you could do it with the standard SD card cameras, but you, you know, as time lapse things, yeah, you forget you don't, things. You don't pay, you're not paying attention to that moon phase. When you go back and look at photos from a week ago, right. you're not corresponding right. the moon, wh yeah. what it was doing last week. It takes what, a little more effort. Right. Whereas live time, you're like, okay, what's the moon today? You can, you can log exactly. that. So yep. it, um, yeah, hopefully uh, some people can grab something and put a little piece to their own puzzle and start killing big deer. Absolutely. Well, thanks again. Um, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. If you uh, if you guys like this episode and find some value, please leave us a review. Give us a thumbs up, share, do something for us. Um, There's a lot of work coming out here, and a lot of people give up their time. Like Damien, this is a Thursday morning episode. I'm sure you probably had stuff to get done today. As Packing well. for an elk hunt. <laughs> yeah, I just got back from a mule deer hunt, killed a 160-inch mule deer. Now you're hitting the road to go chase elk, and be back here in a few weeks to – do it all over and here. Get back the day before opener. So just in time. Do it in Ohio. So busy, busy guy. Um, but uh, that's it. Let's call it a wrap.